Hello and welcome. I'm Jerry Lawson. I'm National Manager at Energy Star at EPA for our work with the faith community. I'm especially happy and proud today to introduce EPA's Deputy Administrator, Janet McCabe, for opening remarks. Janet returned to EPA previ having previously served as Assistant, I'm sorry, Acting Assistant Administrator and Principal Deputy to the Assistant Administrator in the Office of Air and Radiation under President Obama. Prior to rejoining EPA, she was Professor of Practice at the Indiana University and Director of the IU Environmental Resilience Institute. She's worked with state environmental agencies and at uh, children's environmental health advocacy organizations based in Indianapolis. Uh, Janet will have time for a couple of questions at the conclusion of her remarks. And I'd just like to say, Janet, we thank you. You, I know you've worked with the faith community for many years, and uh, it's, it's just wonderful to have you with us. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jerry, and thanks to you. Uh, when I was here during the Obama administration, Jerry Lawson was uh, the person who was working with the faith community on climate change um, and resilience issues, and uh, here I come back again, and here he still is, um, and here you all are, um, uh, people who in, in their daily and professional lives are making such a difference in the way this country thinks about and responds to the crisis of climate change. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's uh, especially uh, uh, um, appropriate to be having a session like this during Earth Week in the run-up to Earth Day. Of course, at EPA, every day is Earth Day. Every minute is Earth Minute. Um, we're running just as fast as we can to uh, make as much progress as we can in the time that we have here during the Obama, the, Obama listen to me, the Biden administration. Um, on uh, climate change, uh, which is uh, absolutely a focus of the President's attention and all of us here at EPA. Um, the, the fact that we're bringing together a, such a diverse panel of faith leaders to discuss the perspectives of their faith traditions on climate change um, uh, and in this historic time of springtime and so many important uh, religious holidays I'm told that there's not been a confluence of so many religious holidays since 1991. It's a long time ago. Um, Passover, Easter, Ramadan, um, uh, this month Baha'i, Hindus, Jains, and Sikhs are also celebrating holy days. Um, I guess uh, springtime is, a, is just a, a, a very important time to think about the importance of creation, of earth, of regeneration, of our responsibility to the natural world and our responsibility to the people who live on this world. So uh, let us turn our attention uh, to those thoughts. Um, and nobody does it better than you all do, from teaching us to respect and carefully use our natural resources, instilling in each of us that being wasteful is wrong, to understanding how pollution is harmful in so many ways, how climate change threatens us all in multiple ways, and that we're doing this to future generations. Our faith traditions are helping us leave our planet and our environment in better shape than we found it and pay attention to people who are suffering around the world today. I have seen it, I've participated firsthand in how the faith community, community can educate, can change hearts and minds, can serve as an, as an example for the community um, and bring even the most unlikely partners together for the common good. I've also seen how so many of us have relied on our own faith to guide us in our pursuit of justice and what's right in this world. As people of faith, it is our obligation as humans to care for the most vulnerable among us and for this blessed creation that we enjoy. The poor communities of color communities that have historically been subjected to a greater burden of pollution, we know this is the case around the world and in our own country. These are also the communities that are bearing now and will bear a greater burden from climate change, and they have fewer resources to be resilient. Climate change and environmental justice could not be more entwined, and this administration has made clear that we will tackle and make progress on both. President Biden, Administrator Regan, and all of us at EPA haven't wasted a minute getting started addressing these two important, critical uh, activities. 
Over the past year, EPA has moved boldly and aggressively to tackle climate pollution and protect overburdened communities by doing what we do best, following the science, following the law, and being transparent so that uh, everybody who is interested in our activities can have access to them and give us their views. We've put out robust and ambitious rules to cut, to cut greenhouse gas emissions from oil and gas sources, light duty vehicles, and hydrofluorocarbons. We continue to work to address climate pollution from the power sector, from heavy duty vehicles, and from other sources. Uh, we will keep this work going. Through these actions and the actions of many other agencies across the federal government, the United States is showing what climate leadership looks like. And I am privileged to be party to many meetings with my fellow deputies from other agencies. And I assure you that every single major agency in this government has a roster of climate-focused activity that it is, that it is working on um, and making huge difference. We're showing what partnership and collaboration can look like. To enhance our relationships, we are prioritizing efforts to present science-based, trustworthy, factual information about how and why the climate is changing and how it's affecting people and the environment. Science is back. We're making information about climate change transparent, accessible, meaningful, and actionable. And that's important to people like you who are working out in communities across the country and need to have information and, and arguments and examples to provide to the people that you work with. We maintain dozens of voluntary programs, such as Energy Star, which provides resources designed specifically for worship facilities, as well as for homes, small businesses, and other workplaces of congregational members, so that we're putting tools in your hands. We provide resources and tools to help reduce the impacts of climate change including lessening the burdens on underserved communities and vulnerable populations. I spent the four years in between my times at EPA working in Indiana with small towns and small cities um, across Indiana who are hungry for things that they, tools they can use, information they can put into action to help protect their communities from the floodwaters, from the fires, uh, from the changes in their local environments. We share resources about research programs and policy to help inform decision making at the national, state, local, and tribal government levels. And we enhance capacity domestically and internationally to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, build resiliency, and adapt to a changing climate. For example, our voluntary programs help protect the climate through efficient use of energy intensive water, climate-ready estuaries, green power, combined heat and power, agricultural coal bed and landfill methane programs, and voluntary as well as regulatory programs for industry. These are programs that operate here in the United States, and we also share them uh, with uh, uh, countries um, all across the world. We have programs for state, local, and tribal governments, for school buses and transportation and ports, Energy Star certifies electric vehicle chargers. The list goes on and on, and you can always check out www.epa.gov to find out, find these resources and more. Um, one last word before I close off and, and, um, and, and turn it back uh, to Jerry. Um, the, it, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which was passed last no November and signed by the President, um, is a huge opportunity, absolutely gargantuan opportunity for resources to be invested in this country to reduce greenhouse gases, to build back our infrastructure in a way that is resilient. And we will be working over the next five years to make sure that those resources go out to communities that need them, that need them for their water infrastructure, wastewater and drinking water infrastructure. Um, uh, it will fund the, the, the conversion of the national school bus fleet to one that is um, uh, as electric as we can get it, um, and where it's not electric, it's going to be very clean, to advance our cleanup of Superfund sites and brownfield sites across the country to do so many things that will improve quality of life, improve public health in our communities, and help address climate change. 
So I look forward to um, hearing from you. Um, I look forward to whatever EPA can do to support your work in your communities, in your faith communities. Um, and thank you so much. More than ever, we need your voices now and your commitment to improving our world as we all work together to build that better future that we all feel a responsibility to do. Thank you so much for having me. And Jerry, I will turn it back to you. Okay, well, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, there's a person concerned that electrification, decarbonization could disproportionately affect low income and marginalized communities. So if you would speak to that, and I have a feeling that environmental justice is part of your response. Um, environmental justice as well as energy equity um, and making sure that this transition does not adversely affect lower income um, uh, and underserved communities. Um, everybody has a right to clean and affordable energy. We were just on the phone this morning with colleagues over at the Department of Energy, um, and they have brought in um, uh, uh, experts to help on this very issue that we are going to be working with, and we're very focused on it as well. So um, uh, there's, there's uh, lots and lots of challenges out there, and, and we're not perfect, um, but we have this very, very much in, in our minds as we design our programs and as we do our outreach. And just one last thing is that the President has made it super clear that in investing the bipartisan infrastructure funds, uh, we are to pay attention to um, equity at every opportunity and to make sure that at least 40% of all those monies goes to disadvantaged communities and that we're implementing our, in our, our programs in a way um, that, that has environmental justice and equity um, very much in the front of our minds. Thank you for that question. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, despite the very dramatic impacts of climate, wildfires, flooding, the just the overall extreme weather, hurricanes, tornadoes. Still, uh, many for many people, it's a very slow moving uh, crisis. And the fact that it is, in a sense, slow moving is, is makes it difficult. Could you uh, speak to that issue? Yeah, I you know I think. I, th I think this has been an issue for decades, right? Um, and yeah. I think that there are still people who don't see this as an imminent crisis. I think many people who have had their houses flooded or have um, run away in the night from a raging wildfire wondering whether they would come back to find their house there or gone um, are feeling more of a sense of urgency. Certainly the the local leaders that I worked with in Indiana, the ones that were in floodplains and along rivers, um, understood they had to learn what does the term 500 year flood even mean, right? And now how do I explain to the people in my community that we've had three 500 year floods over the space of 18 months? That just doesn't compute. But, but you're right that um, we're, it's hard for humans um, to grasp things that are so abstract and, and seem so, um, so far away. One of, the, uh, I, one of the important things to do, I think, is to make sure that people understand the entire range of benefits and opportunities that come with the policies that will help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So um, the uh, uh, energy efficiency projects and, and clean energy these kinds of programs create local jobs, if that's what really gets you going. Um, Brownfields programs um, create opportunity for additional economic activity in communities. So the, 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 the rules that we put in place, even though the greenhouse gas impacts may seem like um, a very long process, uh, also often are reducing particulate matter, air toxins, things that are affecting people's health right here and now today. Um, and can often be a more um, more compelling. Saving money is another um, really good way uh, to get people to think about the kinds of policies that we're doing, and, that, and that's, that's how you can bring disparate views together. Um, also, sadly, I would just say that, that um, it seems like every time we turn around, there is a new report from organizations like the um, International Panel on Climate Change that um, that show more and more clearly science 
and facts from around the world that say that this is, in fact, not slow moving, that this is moving remarkably fast in, in, um, as people think about climatic change. Um, I realize there, too, that people can kind of get burned out with one report after another, and they kind of blend together. Um, so having, helping people see what this means in their own community, I think, is one of the most effective ways to get people interested. Sorry for that long answer, but it's a great question. Thank you for your long answer. <laughs> we appreciate, you know, the, your years of insight and your dedication and speaking for staff at EPA. We're so happy to have you back. So thank you so much for your time today. So we're going to move on to our first panelist. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce the Reverend Dr. Jessica Mormon. Jessica is not only an ordained uh, member of the clergy, she's also a scientist. So her uh, title at the Evangelical Environmental Network is climate scientist. So Jessica, please go right ahead. Thank you so much, Jerry. And I just want to start off by also saying thank you and hello to Deputy Director McCabe. Thank you for your powerful remarks and for being such a strong advocate for children's health and reducing pollution, ensuring a safe climate for everyone. And again, helping make, as you said, um, what can seem like a big far away problem very small. And we appreciate you for joining us uh, in January at our summit with the Evangelical Environmental Network. And I also want to thank Jerry and the whole Energy Star team uh, for putting on this panel and this discussion. And also thank you for just being good friends and partners with EEN over the last several years. Um, from back when uh, it was wonderful to partner with you along with the National Association of Evangelicals and other partners to help commission uh, a study with DOE and the National Renewable Energy Lab on energy waste and energy efficiency in churches and houses of worship. And that study, that was such a landmark study, finding that approximately 30% of energy in churches is wasted and can be recovered. This is a, we were so excited to see this study find a home at Energy Star, and we've been honored to be one of the first co-branded Energy Star action workbooks for congregations. And so again, just truly honored to be partners with Energy Star and to uh, join this panel with so many distinguished colleagues. So as Jerry said, I represent the Evangelical Environmental Network. We are the largest evangelical group in the nation with a ministry to care for God's creation. And we represent over 5 million Christians who have acted with us over the last five years for clean energy and for a healthy environment where everyone can thrive. And as evangelicals, our motivation for this is the fact that we take the Bible seriously. We take seriously what Scripture says. And the first book of the Bible makes it very clear that, that God made us humans in his image to carry out an awesome assignment. And that is to take care and responsibility for everything that he lovingly made. We see this in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 that he deputized us as stewards to take care of the works of his own hands. And so that means that we must take good care of each other as well as the rest of creation. And so for us as evangelicals, our commitment to scripture means that we must take this assignment seriously and we must carry it out to the fullest extent that God intended for us. And so, that's really the basis for us as evangelicals. And as Christians in the 21st century, being good caretakers of God's creation and everyone on the planet, that means acting on climate change. And that means addressing life-threatening pollution through a range of exciting new solutions, um, including advancing clean energy solutions that address both climate change and air pollution. And medical research shows that in study after study that climate change and pollution harm not only the natural environment, but specifically our, our human health. 
we see in studies that have come out from the uh, American Lung Association and many others that show that polluted air, specifically from where we get our energy traditionally, from burning fossil fuels, from gas-powered cars and their exhaust, that this polluted air causes the premature death of as many as 200,000 Americans each year. You look worldwide, that's over 9 million. To put that into context, we've just been experiencing and we're still in uh, this pandemic. And we see that uh, uh, deaths on the scale of a pandemic are happening each year because of air pollution uh, by using fossil powered energy in cars. And it's fossil fuels that are also fueling the climate change that um, Deputy Administrator McCabe, the extreme weather that she referenced that is devastating our towns across the U.S. And as, as uh, Deputy Administrator McCabe mentioned, the truth is, is that it's the most vulnerable and overlooked in society um, that are impacted first and worst by this. And so this includes elderly, this includes our children, those with limited resources, and especially it includes black, brown, and indigenous communities that are impacted due to the legacy and continuation of environmental racism. This just isn't fair, and it goes against God's call for us to love our neighbors, which Jesus calls all Christians to do in Matthew chapter 22. Also, when it comes to those who are most at risk, it's our children, it's pregnant women and their babies that are especially vulnerable to climate and pollution. And that's because our, our young children, babies, their bodies are still developing and so they're especially susceptible to uh, pollution and uh, to heat impact, extreme heat, um, which is becoming, uh, uh, extreme heat waves are becoming longer and more frequent and hotter. And for us as evangelicals and for us at EEN, we see that climate, acting on climate change and taking care of God's creation is actually a matter of life. It's central to us as evangelicals fulfilling our pro-life calling, which is defend life from conception to natural death. And we need to pay attention to any threat to life, especially with our special care for children, both born and unborn. And so that's why our vision, our vision at EEN is that every child has the hope and expectation of a stable climate and a pollution-free world. And for myself as, as a pastor, as a climate scientist, but especially as a mother, <laughs> this really hits home to make sure that my children and everybody else's child has that hopeful future to look into. And uh, for me, we're, as evangelicals, we're always talking about the good news. And the good news when it comes to climate and pollution is that all of these things are preventable. <laughs> we have the tools, the know-how, we have good policy solutions to solve these problems, the problems of climate change, the problem of rampant air pollution. And that's why at EEN, we engage at the policy level. We partner with EPA. And when we approach policy, our standpoint is that we are grounded and guided by scripture, but also informed by science. And so that leads to our three policy planks that we have at EEN, which is to defend life, protect life from the threats of air pollution, for the threats of an unstable and volatile climate, that we protect God's creation, which is uh, also an incredible climate solution through various natural climate solutions, and then also, as Deputy Administrator McKay mentioned, these create, doing so creates opportunities for prosperity through new clean jobs, new jobs in the clean energy economy. And so when we're evaluating policy, we're looking at it from these three lens, lenses. And so when it comes to our churches, they ha also have an important role to play in these solutions. Um, however, within our evangelical community, the, uh, the doctrine of environmental stewardship has at times been forgotten or less emphasized, especially over the last several decades. And so that's why it's part of our mission at EEN to come alongside evangelical churches in rediscovering and reclaiming that biblical mandate that we have to care for God's creation. And that's why Energy Star has been such an important partner with us in that mission. 
And um, if we could advance to the next slide, um, I just want to highlight uh, the Energy Star Action Workbook for Congregations. And this, what we found is that for so many evangelical churches, we found that at times it can actually be easier to start that stewardship conversation by addressing good financial stewardship that comes through energy conservation. And it's been so powerful to be able to point um, to talk with churches, talk with pastors, church leaders, that they can save up to 30% of their energy bills with no to low cost energy efficiency improvements. And that they can then take those savings and put them towards other budget items like mission work um, and other areas of their ministry. And as a, a, a local church pa pastor, I know uh, the strain of tight budgets. And so I can tell you that the opportunity to save a big chunk of your uh, energy bill and put that towards um, uh, put that towards uh, your other mission areas, that's a big deal. It makes a big difference. And I just really want to thank uh, Energy Star for helping be that critical bridge for us to then have those discussions about then being good environmental stewards, good climate stewards, um, and for making it easy for pastors to do that. And so um, with that, uh, I want to hand the mic back to Jerry and uh, I give the floor to our other panelists. Thank you. Hi, Jerry. Oh, Jerry, I think you may be on mute. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, didn't press the buttons. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for talking about uh, co-branding. We have done that with a lot of the faith community, and uh, it, it's a multiplier of credibility. We cover the energy aspect, and uh, there's so many uh, uh, aspects and angles for which our faith community partners have such great credibility. So I'm really happy to uh, introduce an old friend now, uh, Dan Misla, who is the founder of the Catholic Climate Covenant and also a longtime uh, member of the uh, Energy and Environment Committee of the, uh, Catholic, of the Conference of Catholic Facility Management. Dan? Thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, old is getting um, uncomfortable <laughs> these <laughs> days, but, but here we are. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and uh, I think what a lot of the, the uh, participants in this um, webinar will learn is that many of our faith traditions overlap quite a bit in terms of our theology and our, our way of thinking about God's gift of creation and how we, uh, how we go about this work. But let me tell you a little bit about Catholic Climate Covenant. So as the slide says, we're found, we were founded in 2006 with the support of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. We have a network of 20 national Catholic organizations that are partners with us. Um, we, our key activities are advocacy, organizing, and education. And our goal is to share authentic Catholic teaching that includes both the care for creation and care for the poor. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And really to build a network for action. Uh, next. So, uh, at the core of Catholic social teaching, which begins with the um, protection and promotion of human life and human dignity and ends with care of creation, but at its core is this notion of the common good. And Pope Francis has said in his encyclical from 2015, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, he says an integral ecology is inseparable from the notion of the common good, a central and unifying principle of social ethics. The common good is the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. Now, that's um, a very tall order. Uh, it's a framework upon which, um, at least in the Catholic community, and I think other, other faith communities as well, would, would judge um, how policies and programs are working. Are they working for the common good? or are they benefiting just one particular group or even one particular individual? So we have this framework. Nobody says it's gonna be easy to, to meet this common good goal, but it's what we always need to strive to do. And so that's a real key part of Catholic social teaching. 
And I think the experience of the pandemic during this, uh, you know, these past couple of years uh, is very instructive. You know, what, it, what should we all be doing for the good of all? How can we do, uh, you know, how can we um, uh, take care of the common good, not just our own individual good, not just the good of our family, but the good of everyone? Uh, so that's at the core of, of, our, of our teaching. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> In addition, um, one of the core principles of Catholic social teaching is how do our actions and our policies and our behaviors impact the poorest? Uh, um, Deputy Administrator McCabe said this very well in her remarks, but we really need to not just be focused on polar bears, but also on people, and in particular people who are most vulnerable to to our um, our, our neglect of the environment, uh, particularly with the issue of climate change. So in, in the encyclical, Pope Francis says, the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest people. So, you know, so that's, that's really also another another key element of how we judge um, what we do and how we do it. Next slide. And I think this this um, quote that was also appeared in Laudato Si actually came from the previous Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, during his first um, uh, mass, his first uh, liturgical celebration as Pope, uh, when he said during his, his preaching and his homily, he said, the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. And I, I just, I, I love that quote because it, I think it really speaks to this, um, this lack of sort of an interior grounding that I think we all need and that the faith community ought to be bringing to society. What, what, how do we, how do we face the world as, as people, as, as, a, as a society, um, as individuals in our families, in our communities, in our nation, and in our world, and the you know the, the neglect of our own spiritual life and the neglect of our neighbors have literally led to the expansion of deserts, and I think that that's that's really something to think about and to contemplate. And I, and I think it's a really there's a there's a lot in that quote that uh, you know we don't have time to get into now, but I would I would ask you to uh, also meditate upon that. So let me next, please. Um, so let me go to the to what we do. What what does the Catholic Climate Covenant do? So we have a number of programs, and I'm just going to touch on just a few because we don't have that much time. But one of the most one of the things we're most proud of is we we have about uh, 500 or so um, creation care teams. So these are these are folks based in parishes doing all kinds of work from everything from instituting a recycling program to a community garden to um, sealing up the doors and windows in their in their church and the rectory and other buildings on the property, and this and, and then doing a lot of education work as well. This is the diocese of San Diego, which uh, they have a number of, of parishes that uh, have creation care teams. Now, I will admit in the same breath that there's 17,000 parishes, and we have about 500 of them or so organized to do this type of activity. Undoubtedly, there are more parishes doing this type of work that we don't know about. But it's uh, we have a lot of growth. <laughs> we have a lot of room to grow. Next slide. Uh, the other thing that we started about a year and a half ago now is a uh, young adult mobilization program. So we're working with with young adults throughout the country to try to um, channel the energy that they have around the issue of climate change and environmental degradation, and let them know that their church cares. Uh, and to let them know that we that the church has teaching, it has a spiritual foundation, it has a theological foundation that they can rely upon as they as they go about their work in helping to uh, to create a better uh, or take better care of God's good gifts of creation. So we we started this program where where um, there's a lot of excitement and energy around it, uh, and we're just trying to channel that energy energy into very practical types of things that we can do. Uh, next slide. Each year we put out two, um, uh, one in the fall, one in the spring, two um, hour, hour and a half long programs that we develop ourselves and, and send them out to folks. Uh, one, of course, is on Earth Day, around Earth Day this time of year, um, where we, we, uh, we basically 
open with a prayer, have a video, have folks reflect on that. It's, it's designed for small groups. And then we have usually two action steps. One is sort of practical and the other is advocacy, urging folks to write to their members of Congress or their senators or, uh, or their local officials, or even advocating uh, to their own pastor, uh, you know, to, to, um, to do more of this type of work. So that's, uh, that's our Earth Day program. Next slide. And then in October, uh, we celebrate the Feast of St. Francis, the patron saint of those who, who, uh, who work on care for creation, uh, October 4th. And we, we produce this kind of a similar type of a thing every year. Uh, we get about, and we get anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 downloads of these programs every year. So they're, they're quite popular and, and uh, we're, we're very happy to do those. Um, next slide. One of the things that the covenant has been asked to do by the Vatican and the U.S. bishops is to help manage um, this new initiative from the Vatican called the Laudato Si Action Platform. So again, Laudato Si came out in 2015. Last November, they launched the Laudato Si Action Platform, and we're trying to help manage that in the United States. Um, go to the next slide, if you will. So there are there, uh, seven is a great number in, in the in the Catholic world, uh, seven sacraments uh, and so forth. But we have seven sectors with seven goals over seven years. So what what the Vatican has asked is that these different these seven different sectors, everything from, you know, one sector would be families, another one would be parishes and schools, uh, or uh, parishes and and um, dioceses, another one would be schools, higher education, healthcare, and so forth, and they are asked to do these seven goals, um, which are listed there on on the left, uh, to to, um, to over over a period of seven years to try to have that entity that institution become more sustainable. So the Vatican has the Laudato Si Action Platform website. We complemented that with what we call God's Planet US website, which are stories of of these different sectors. Um, instituting these different goals. So that's been a huge focus of our work and will be in the years to come. Next slide. Then uh, we also have a Catholic Energies program. Um, this, uh, the, the bird's eye view of this video, of this um, uh, solar field is actually in the District of Columbia. These are 5,072 panels on a piece of property that's owned by Catholic Charities. Uh, for the Archdiocese of Washington. Um, this, this site uh, has, um, uh, also is, generates about 2.7 million kilowatt hours per year, which is equivalent to powering about 350 homes. It's offsetting 100% of the electric use of all of the Catholic Charities buildings in DC. Um, and it's uh, that, that building on the property or where Mother Teresa's nuns are doing a hospice care for indigent people in the District of Columbia, and the the money that's generated from the the uh, the owner of this of this um, solar array is being used to offset the cost of deferred maintenance on that building. And then there's uh, a pollinator plants between those panels, so it's become an urban pollinator study garden. So it's just a great project. In conclusion, last slide: um, visit us. Come to our website, CatholicClimateCovenant.org, and learn about all the other things that we're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate it. Appreciate your work. Okay, uh, next, uh, a longtime colleague and friend, Imam Safet Abed Kadovic. He's the head of the Office for Interfaith and Community Alliances and Government Relations for the Islamic Society of North America. Welcome, Safet. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, wonderful to be with you all. What a blessing and an honor to share in this important uh, program. Uh, want to thank the organizers and Jerry and your wonderful team at the EPA uh, Energy Star Program for organizing and, and, and bringing us all together. You know, in the, in the religious traditions, we always talk about this uh, idea of calling and responding to the call. So Jerry, you made the call, we responded and um, as dutiful and faith, peoples of faith will do. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe for her wonderful uh, introduction and remarks and for the um, 
renewal of the of the direction. This is the time of renewal, spring a renewal of the direction that the EPA at the level uh, at the highest level is 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 undergoing a, under your leadership and the leadership of the Biden administration to be engaged with the communities to put science as a guiding principle for the work that's being done and to um, advocate for issues that affect and impact the most vulnerable amongst us. Um, greetings from, I'm coming to you from my home in New Jersey today, I'm working remotely from Jersey, um, the Garden State and uh, the uh, traditional ancestral lands of the Lape peoples. And um, during these days, more so I think than ever before, there's a crying need to return to a lot of the principles and the practices of those whose lives were in harmony with Mother Earth and not uh, viewing themselves as apart and above and against, in some cases, Mother Earth and, and her resources. We need to do this for ourselves, for our children, and our children's children, and all the generations to come. Um, I don't have the slides to share with you today, um, but um, I'll, what I'll try to do is, in a brief way, summarize some of the environmental work that the Islamic Society of North America has been involved in, and uh, some of sort of the the, the genesis towards that work. Um, in a nutshell, the development of Islamic environmental work and issues regarding eco-justice uh, has a, a history here in America. Um, and part of that has to do with the, the unwritten history and, the, and sort of sometimes the under-recognized um, and appreciated work of, of those who are engaged in organic farming early on and the idea of regeneration and low impact farming practices. Uh, these existed both within inner city communities as well as uh, uh, um, amongst our African American brothers and sisters and the, their communities who used to work towards development of farms in the earliest in 1930s and 1940s uh, to provide um, organic health food, healthy food from uh, areas so that they, even if they lived in food deserts, uh, which unfortunately many of our inner cities still are, are blighted by, that they were able to have access to um, vegetables and fresh vegetables and fruits in season that were grown on, on, on community organized and owned farms. That being said, some of the um, theological framing of the modern Muslim eco-theological work has been done in the early 1950s, primarily by one of our great leading scholars, Dr. Sayed Hussein Nasser, um, in a series of lectures he gave at the University of Chicago on Islam's eco-theologies. And he has a lot of books written on nature and the environment, um, and it provides a very uh, strong and, and, and structured framework as to sort of Islam's eco-theology. Um, Theological work and practical work were separated by many, many years. Um, it wasn't until the mid 2000s that we begin to see the rise of various green uh, Muslim um, organizations, usually masjid based, um, um, sometimes outside of the masjid. Um, and they focused on bringing to the fore issues with regard to Islam's teachings, or I can call it Islam's commentaries on various types of environmental work that was being done at the national level by various secular and regional levels by various secular um, organizations that had done some great work. Um, and a lot of this was empowered by, by members of the community, but especially young students who had graduated in the various environmental sciences um, through their university education and come back to their communities and wanted to see a way in which religious teachings could impact the members of the communities. Uh, surveys, uh, longitudinal surveys as well as, as, as concurrent surveys have shown that the Muslim community, especially in the United States of America, uh, tends to attach a significant level of religious uh, import and listening to religious teachings when it comes to issues with regard to the environment. And so uh, the impact of religious talk to Muslim communities is, is, is not negligible in terms of affecting change, especially when we talk about the necessary life child, lifestyle changes and behavioral changes that are necessary. Um, 
these various green Muslim uh, groupings in different parts of the country, including in Washington, D.C., the Green Muslims of D.C., um, began to sort of develop and chart out programs, um, but they were working at the grassroots level, which in, 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 in organizational speak means that they were uh, working separately and apart from one another, but coming to similar conclusions and to similar ideas and concepts. The idea of sharing the knowledge and the resources and the information and the learning experience with regard to the work within their own communities had not yet reached to the fore. And this is sort of where ISNA comes into the picture. At the national level, um, the Islamic Society of North America in uh, 2013, 2014, 2015 developed under its um, Masjid Development Committee a special task force known as the Green Mosque Task Force. And it was dedicated to finding ways and means by which Muslim communities through their uh, centers of community, which, which were the mosques, as well as Islamic schools, full-time Muslim parochial schools, could engage in environmental issues and come to understand them. So a lot of the work initially was done on developing, and it continues to be on developing awareness and understanding of Islam's eco-teachings and eco-theologies and how they can impact through the lived example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lifestyle changes, community uh, behavioral changes with regard to um, working in, working with, being part and parcel of the world in which we live. Following Islam's principles regarding stewardship, they're not uncommon from the other Abrahamic faith traditions. Uh, stewardship, the idea of a trust that the earth and, and all of her blessings are a trust, and we are caretakers and caregivers for that trust. And so uh, those teachings um, were able to be shared and are continuing to be shared through various means, webinars, booklets, um, lectures, various types of programming within the communities. Um, a special time for the Muslim community is during the month of Ramadan. It's an entire month, 30 days, where we, we're from dawn to dusk. We, we, we engage in a time of self-reflection, and we leave off of, uh, uh, of paying so much attention to the material things that were normally are part and parcel of our daily lives as, as, as people, especially here, who have the luxury for that within the, within the first world, or as I say, within the global north. And especially within within the within the United States of America, um, so there's a chance sort of for the community to reflect upon these special blessings, the blessings of the ability to eat food, to be secure in one's home, to drink water, um, and think about how these various types of inputs, life-giving inputs, necessary for life inputs, have become part and parcel of our. Um, where they come from, how they got to us, what our responsibility is with regard to that. And so Ramadan provides this opportunity more so than any time, other time of the year for an entire month, 30 days, where the Muslim community can engage in practices that hopefully will become habits of the heart. And so the Green Ramadan Campaign is one of the programs which, which, which the Islamic Society of North America began to uphold, where less is more. We began also to engage with various types of programmings, and we we're very happy to be able to have co-branded um, EPA workbook for Muslim congregations as well. And at the international level, the Islamic Society of North America has focused on the issue specifically regarding fossil fuel burning, fossil fuel divestment, and seeking out renewable energy solutions, recognizing that those impacted first and worst are the most vulnerable communities. And many of these communities fall within the global south, where many of the immigrants from the Muslim world that came to America come from. So we're looking forward to finding ways in which we can continue to work together to share with other faith communities the experiences that we have in, in, in rising up together to face the, 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 the unprecedented channel, challenges of climate change, both here and abroad. And um, thank you very much for being able to be part of this webinar. Safa, thank you so much for being with us and uh, sharing insights from your community. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Yakir Manella. He's the CEO of Hazon and Pearlstone, the largest Jewish environmental group. Yakir? Good afternoon, everyone. Happy springtime, happy Earth Week, Ramadan Mubarak, happy Easter, and happy Passover. 
I want to thank Rosemary Wallace, Jerry Lawson, and Deputy Administrator McCabe. Thank you so much for your leadership on behalf of all of us, the American people, and all life on this planet. To my esteemed panelists, Jessica, Dan, Safed, and Susan, it is a great honor to learn from and walk with you on this path together. So my name is Yakir Manella, and I am the CEO of Chazon, the largest Jewish environmental organization in the country, where our mission is to lead a transformative movement deeply weaving sustainability into the fabric of Jewish life in order to create a healthier, more sustainable, and more equitable world for all. We connect people to the earth and to each other, building flourishing Jewish communities and a more sustainable future through three main strategies that collectively impact well over 100,000 people each year. Each year. First, through immersive retreat experiences at our two retreat centers. Second, through inspiring Jewish outdoor environmental education programs. And third, by mobilizing the Jewish world to take on impactful climate action. And in these ways, Chazon catalyzes culture change and systemic change across the Jewish world and beyond. So let's unpack what that, what that looks like a little bit. First slide, please. We run lots of Jewish environmental education programs. Uh, that connect kids and families to the earth and to God's creation. Um, and this first slide here, um, Farm and Forest School uh, immerses kids in learning farm and wilderness survival skills like wild edibles, fire building, shelter building, tracking, and more, all integrated with Jewish wisdom, stories, song, and spirituality. Um, next slide. Um, Teva is a full week nature immersion experience that has impacted thousands of Jewish day school students over the years, modeled after nature's classroom and adapted for our religious and cultural context, combining environmental science and Jewish studies, teaching awareness, interconnectedness, and responsibility. I was trained Hi, as a educator. Hi. Hi, sorry, this is Rosemary. Uh, for some reason, the slides are, are a little bit slow to upload, but they will upload in a minute. Okay. Um, I think I'll just keep going, and we can we can show we have some great pictures we can show people as, as they come online. Um, so Teva, as I was saying, uh, teaches awareness, interconnectedness, and responsibility. And I was trained as a Teva educator about 20 years ago, and was deeply moved and motivated by that that experience to do this work over the last couple of decades. Uh, and the and slide after that is that I met my wife while I was doing Teva, and she was doing Adama, a young adult immersive Jewish farming fellowship interweaving Jewish spiritual practice and intentional community with regenerative organic agriculture and farming and land stewardship. Adama alumni become rabbis of every denomination and Jewish leaders of all kinds, as well as secular environmental and climate activists as well, all informed by their profound personal spiritual connection to the earth. Um, next slide. And nowhere is that spiritual connection more evident than in our immersive holiday celebrations. Uh, and, and family camp, um, where we celebrate Passover as both the Festival of Freedom and the Festival of Spring, um, and come together as families to build community on the land together. Um, next slide. And Sukkot is an amazing autumn harvest festival where we build a temporary hut on the farm, live on the land, welcome guests for meals, and basically throw a week-long farm-to-table glamping party. <laughs> it's pretty fun. So, and too often our ancient agrarian and cultural roots have been forgotten under the avalanche of American consumerism. So these holiday celebrations remind us of who we really are, what's really important, and how we can reconnect to the earth and to each other. Next slide. So all this grassroots education uh, really built up a powerful movement over the past 20 years, and now we are leveraging that movement into the largest climate action effort in Jewish history bringing together the largest Jewish umbrella organizations in the country, representing hundreds of organizations and millions of constituents, Chazon is forming the Jewish Climate Leadership Coalition, convening this national leadership roundtable group, and working towards this fall when we will release our founding statement and climate action plans for each of these umbrella organizations, demonstrating a widespread mainstream Jewish commitment to decarbonizing Jewish life and our broader society. We'll then invite Jewish organizations everywhere to join us so that by the end of this year, we anticipate hundreds of Jewish organizations signing onto the coalition and joining our roundtable process that will support them in creating, releasing, and regularly updating their own climate action plans. So next, I wanna highlight some important climate action initiatives with particularly strong potential within our coalition. Next slide. 
So JTree was started by grassroots volunteers and has grown nationwide, mobilizing Jewish communities to both plant trees with our own two hands and also donate to plant and protect our forests as well. And I've done the math and given the global one trillion tree project, and based on the Jewish population size of 0.02%, our proportional goal for the Jewish people is therefore to plant and protect 200 million trees in the years ahead in our national forests and priority conservation areas around the world and in urban environments here at home. Next slide, please. Another key initiative is the Green Loan Fund we've developed in Baltimore and plan to scale nationwide. This revolving loan fund has saved participating Jewish institutions real money on their utility bills while simultaneously lowering their carbon footprint. And this is not just for Jews, all faith-based organizations in the Baltimore area are welcome to apply. And we're already on our way to expanding this offering nationwide, and we really see this as a key tool moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, another project here in Baltimore that we hope to replicate is our Jewish Community Solar Farm, where we've consolidated our purchasing power under, uh, uh, under the umbrella auspices of the Jewish Community Federation of Baltimore in order to sign a 20-year power purchase agreement with a local solar developer, which will create a large industrial rooftop solar field and save the Baltimore Jewish community on utilities, $2 million over 20 years, while transitioning us to operate on 50% solar power and headed to 100% in the years ahead. Solar regulations vary by state, so replication may not be so straightforward here, but we are working hard to figure out how else and where else we might catalyze communal solar transition. Next slide, please. Um, probably the most powerful cultural force pushing our climate action agenda forward is the Jewish Youth Climate Movement, a truly awe-inspiring and rapidly exponentially growing army of young Jewish climate activists that are speaking up and advocating for aggressive climate policy, divestment from fossil fuels, and pushing our communities to embody our biblical teachings and Jewish values of stewardship for God's creation. JYCM has grown to engage hundreds of teams in more than 40 chapters nationwide in just two years. And these teams are just so passionate and engaged and inspiring. Supporting them is definitely one of the best parts of my job and very clearly one of our strongest assets in the fight for culture change that leads to a livable climate future. Next slide, please. So the Jewish Climate Leadership Coalition is bringing together a diversity of committed leaders to study and scale these climate action initiatives and many others. And I can tell you that these leaders really are getting on board in a new way right now because it's time. So we really are mobilizing climate action across the Jewish world at pace and at scale. And our goal is to mobilize at least 1,500 North American Jewish organizations to cut their greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. And Energy Star has been and will continue to be a key partner in that work. Kazone is proud to be an Energy Star partner, co-branding and promoting Energy Star's workbook, elevating these critical tools for measuring and benchmarking greenhouse gas emissions and working to reduce those emissions over time. This workbook and the portfolio manager tools have, have been and will be critical to us and our partners in the Jewish Climate Leadership Coalition. We could not do this work without the leadership, partnership, and support of everyone at EPA and the Energy Star team. Thank you so much for showing us the way forward. Um, no more slides, but a few more words. Uh, so I'll share my email address uh, and website here in the chat and would love to connect with anybody interested in learning more. And to close, I want to share the perspective of Gus Spath, who co-founded the Natural Resources Defense Council and World Resources Institute. He said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. So yeah, we, we seek transformation. And, and this reminds me of the Passover story celebrated this week, because when the Israelites left Egypt, they didn't know what lie ahead. Forty years of wandering. They just left, entering the freedom and the uncertainty of the unknown. Science tells us today that we have a lot more than 40 years of wandering ahead of us through the deserts of climate crisis. And this is the Shemitah year in the Hebrew calendar, the sabbatical year, when we let the land rest and forgive all debts. This year a radical reset and powerful biblical tradition enacting sustainability and justice. So may we all embody transformation together with all our collective wisdom and resilience, and may we continue to come together to help each other find our way through this wilderness. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Kira, thank you so very much. We appreciate your work collaborating interfaith and collaborating across the very broad Jewish community. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I deliberately ask our friend Susan 
to uh, be our last speaker because she is the president of Interfaith Power and Light, Susan Hendershot. It's all yours. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I do want to thank Jerry and the team at EPA Energy Star for um, pulling this event together today. Uh, and also to my co-presenters, it's always just a thrill to be with you and to learn from all of you. So very excited um, to see all of you and to hear your words today as well. Um, as Jerry said, I'm Reverend Susan Hendershot and I serve as the president of Interfaith Power and Light. And our mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. And I want to start by telling you a story. In 2015, a small 125 member congregation, the Neighborhood United Church of Christ in Bath, Maine, sold their old place of worship and purchased a small steakhouse in the downtown where they could both worship and use the commercial kitchen to help feed the food insecure, which is an ongoing mission of theirs. The building was heated with propane, but had a perfect south facing orientation for solar, and they wanted to reduce their use of fossil fuels. They initiated their solar effort in 2017, but soon found that they faced a few challenges. First, they knew that they needed to make the building more energy efficient and electrify their heating system to sens sensibly realize their solar hopes, but there was no money in the budget for energy improvements. Next, a leaky rubber membrane on the flat portion of the roof was failing and needed immediate replacement. And a search for the source of the leak, the unhappy discovery that when the steakhouse owner added the pitched roof to what had been a flat roofed gas station, he added no attic insulation. They knew a professional energy audit should guide them, but there was no money for that either. The path to solar would require a series of small steps to be undertaken one at a time. After meeting th those initial challenges by raising money for the roof repair, the energy audit, insulation, upgrading their lighting, insulating windows, and other building electrification measures, in April of 20, it was finally time to meet their solar challenge. That's when they discovered the next challenge the land use code forbade solar visible from the street within the historic district where they were located. They would have to get the code changed to realize their goal. Solar success suddenly seemed doubtful. But determined, their solar team submitted a zoning code amendment for approval. The planning board didn't accept the first attempt, but passed their second one on to the city council. The city council tabled it, sending it back to them for more language modification. But their third attempt passed the council unanimously. And on September 20th, they switched on their new system. The change in the land use code makes it possible for others within the historic district to install properly sited solar arrays visible from the street. Without the initiative by this congregation, this would not be possible. They had persuaded the city council to not only treasure Bath's past, but to also support its clean energy future in a very specific way. The members of this congregation say that they were inspired by the urgency of the climate crisis and the realization that local mitigation and adaptation efforts undertaken quickly are of critical importance. They view climate change as a moral issue that obligates them to act, a threat multiplier that most of all endangers the poor. It was this concern, not the eventual cost savings, which motivated their faith community's support of solar. And they are the winning congregation in IPL's 2022 Cool Congregations Challenge in the Community Inspiration category. This program teaches faith communities how to reduce their energy use and therefore their greenhouse gas emissions that are driving the climate crisis by centering these initiatives as an act of faith. And I wanna thank Jerry Lawson for serving as one of our expert judges for this program for the past two years. 
ITL has been proud to partner with EPA's Energy Star program for congregations for many years. And oftentimes these practical measures that are undertaken by faith communities in order to achieve greater energy efficiency or install renewable energy projects leads down the path to policy advocacy. There's no need to tell you about the latest assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change focusing on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. It's a sobering read, reminding us of the urgency to take bold and swift action to avert the worst impact of climate change, and that it's the poor and historically marginalized who suffer first and worst. I'm ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and I served local congregations for many years. I thought that I was doing all I could in caring for the sacred earth. I was recycling, I had changed my light bulbs, planted a garden, and I was composting, but never making the connection between other issues that I was passionate about, like solving hunger and climate advocacy. The connection was made for me when I read an article about the geopolitics of food and how destruction of harvest due to drought and wildfires fueled by climate change were driving food shortages and global food insecurity. And I recognized that my sons and the generations coming after them would be even more impacted than my own. This is what drives my climate advocacy today. Interfaith Power and Light has a unique approach with a national organization and affiliates in 40 states that are reaching more than 22,000 faith communities nationally. We collaborate with those state affiliates in community action, policy advocacy, and narrative change within the faith constituency for personal and societal transformation on climate change and its many intersectional justice issues. Our state affiliates have contributed to landmark state policy wins from 100% clean energy targets, to clean car standards, to blocking oil pipelines and shutting down coal plants. The affiliates build relationships with policymakers at the state and local levels, while the fact that congregations are greening houses of worship and preaching and teaching about caring for creation lend integrity as we urge governments to do the same. At the federal level, we have been advocating for legislation like the bipartisan infrastructure bill that Deputy Administrator McCabe spoke about and the climate provisions in the Build Back Better Act. We also believe that regulatory action is important, which is why we organize religious leaders to testify at EPA hearings on emissions for power plants or methane emissions from oil and gas drilling and at a Department of Transportation hearing on fuel efficiency 